The citric acid cycle is a very important process inside our cells because it's how we're able to actually metabolize fuel molecules. It's how we can break down glucose molecules and amino acids and fats to form high energy ATP molecules. On top of that, as we'll see in a future lecture, the citric acid cycle is also actually used to synthesize many types of building block molecules used by our cells. Now, there are three ways by which we can actually regulate the citric acid cycle. The first method is what we discussed previously. It's by regulating pyruvate decarboxylation. So remember that inside the cytoplasm, glucose molecules undergo glycolysis to form pyruvate. And in the presence of oxygen, the pyruvate moves into the matrix of the mitochondria where we undergo pyruvate decarboxylation. And what this produces is acetylcoenzyme A. Now, once this step takes place, it's an irreversible step that commits the glucose derivative, the acetyl coenzyme A, to undergoing the citric acid cycle, or in some cases, we can actually use it to form fat molecules, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. But basically, by regulating this step, we call pyruvate decarboxylation, by either turning it on or off, we can regulate the rate of the citric acid cycle. Now, that's the first process of regulation. The other two methods by which we can regulate the rate of the citric acid cycle is by regulating the steps of the citric acid cycle itself. So out of the eight steps of the citric acid cycle, two of these steps are oxidative decarboxylation steps. And both of these steps are controlled by allosteric enzymes. So step three and step four are the two oxidative decarboxylation steps. And the enzymes that regulate these two steps are allosteric enzymes, which as we'll see in just a moment, are actually regulated by specific types of allosteric effector molecules. So the citric acid cycle has two regulatory points that are used to control its rate. And both of these points are allosteric enzymes used by the steps of the citric acid cycle, the TCA cycle. So let's quickly remember the eight different steps. In step one, we take the four carbon oxaloacetate combined with the acetyl group of acetyl coenzyme A to form a six carbon molecule known as citrate. The citrate is then transformed into isocitrate, another six carbon molecule, which is basically an isomer to citrate. The isocitrate then undergoes step three that is catalyzed by an allosteric enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that produces alpha ketoglutarate. The alpha ketoglutarate, then catalyzed by an enzyme known as alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, undergoes step four, an other oxidation, oxidative decarboxylation step to produce a C4 molecule, a four carbon molecule known as succinyl coenzyme A. And in the next series of steps, so in this step, we transform the succinyl coenzyme A into succinate. Succinate is then transformed into fumarate. Fumarate is then transformed into the L-isomer of malate. Malate is then transformed back into oxaloacetate, and this step basically repeats itself. And these are the two important points that we have to focus on. These are the allosteric enzymes that our cells can actually use to regulate the rate at which the citric acid cycle takes place. And so to begin, let's focus on step three that is catalyzed by the allosteric enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase. <coughs> so we can break down step three into two steps. We have 3A and 3B. In 3A, we have the oxidation reduction step. This basically takes place, or the isocitrate is oxidized into an intermediate oxalosuccinate. In the process, we reduce the NAD plus coenzyme into NADH, and the NADH can then be used by the electron transport chain, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. In the second step, 3B, the oxalosuccinate undergoes a decarboxylation step in which we release a carbon dioxide and we produce a, four, uh, a five carbon molecule, alpha ketoglutarate. Now, let's imagine inside our cell, we want to produce ATP molecules. So we have a low energy charge value, we don't have enough ATP, and so we want to make sure, or the cell wants to make sure, that the citric acid cycle takes place at a high rate. 
And what the cell does is to make sure the rate is high, it is, is it stimulates the isocitrate dehydrogenase. So the isocitrate dehydrogenase, being an allosteric enzyme, contains allosteric regulatory sites. And an allosteric activator molecule, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, will go on and bind on two special locations on, on the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase. And once it binds, it increases its affinity for the substrate molecule isocitrate. And this isocitrate dehydrogenase will bind the isocitrate and the NAD plus more readily and that will increase the rate at which this reaction actually takes place and that will increase the rate at which the overall citric acid cycle will actually take place. So when the cell needs to produce energy molecules, it has a low content of ATP. ADP will bind onto a regulatory site of the isocitrate dehydrogenase enzyme. This will increase the affinity of the enzyme for the substrate isocitrate, which will increase the rate of the citric acid cycle. Now, conversely, what happens if we have plenty of ATP inside our cell, so we have a high energy charge value and the cell doesn't want to actually use energy to produce these ATP molecules, and so it wants to decrease the rate at which the citric acid cycle takes place. And now what happens, instead of having allosteric activators, we have allosteric inhibitors that will bind onto isocitrate dehydrogenase and decrease its affinity for the isocitrate molecule. In fact, what will happen is, the ATP molecules themselves will bind onto a special region of isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that will decrease the rate at which it will actually take place. On top of that, we also have NADH that will bind onto a special site of the isocitrate, it will kick off the NAD plus. And if there is no NAD plus bound to the isocitrate dehydrogenase enzyme, if the NADH is bound instead of the NAD plus, step 3A cannot take place. And so because that happens, because the NADH kicks off the NAD+, the isocitrate dehydrogenase enzyme cannot carry out its function. So we see that if we have high levels of ATP, a high energy charge value, we will not need to generate any more ATP. In fact, ATP will act as an allosteric inhibitor of isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that will decrease the affinity for the substrate. In addition, the NADH will kick off the NAD plus that is needed for step 3A to take place, and that will inhibit the activity of isocitrate dehydrogenase, decrease the rate at which this step actually takes place, and that will decrease the rate of the, citrate, uh, of the citric acid cycle. So let's take a look at the following diagram to see exactly what we mean. So the pyruvate is transformed into acetyl coenzyme A via pyruvate decarboxylation. The citrate then is produced and once the citrate is produced, it is isomerized into isocitrate. The isocitrate is then transformed into alpha-ketoglutarate by the activity of isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now, if we want to produce more ATP molecules, we want to increase the rate of the citric acid cycle. So ADP produces a positive feedback loop that essentially increases the activity of this isocitrate dehydrogenase enzyme. But if we have plenty of ATP inside our body, the cell must signal somehow for the citric acid cycle to actually decrease its activity. In fact, it also has to signal for glycolysis to actually decrease its activity. And so what happens is ATP and NADH act as allosteric inhibitors, they bind to isocitrate dehydrogenase, and they turn off the activity of this enzyme. And so what that means is we cannot transform the isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. And so what happens once we turn off enzyme 3, there is a buildup of isocitrate, and isocitrate is pretty much at equilibrium with citrate because this reaction is essentially at equilibrium. And so the isocitrate, once there's a buildup of isocitrate, there will also be a buildup of the citrate molecule. 
and the citrate molecule, as it builds up, it moves into the cytoplasm of our cell from the matrix of the mitochondria. And in the cytoplasm, if you remember back to regulation of, glyco of, of glycolysis, the citrate actually inhibits a specific type of enzyme in glycolysis, which inhibits the rate at which glycolysis decreases the rate at which glycolysis actually takes place. And the citrate can actually be used to form fat molecules, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. Now, let's move on to step four. Step four is the second oxidative decarboxylation step of the citric acid cycle, and this is catalyzed by alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, also an allosteric enzyme. So, Remember back to our discussion that this is actually step four. In step four, we take the alpha-ketoglutarate produced in step three, and we basically kick off a carbon dioxide molecule and replace it with coenzyme A to form succinyl coenzyme A. We also oxidize the alpha-ketoglutarate and reduce the NAD plus into NADH, and here's our carbon dioxide molecule. So alpha-ketoglutarate catalyzes the second oxidative decarboxylation step. Now, if we have a high energy charge value inside our cell, so we have plenty of ATP molecules to go around, and we don't want to produce any more ATP molecules, we see that ATP, as well as these two molecules produced, will act as allosteric inhibitors. So ATP, as well as succinyl coenzyme A and NADH, will basically act as allosteric inhibitors, binding onto special regulatory sites of this alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase enzyme, and that will inhibit its activity. And so when we have plenty of ATP, the rate of the citric acid cycle is basically decreased by inhibiting the activity of these two enzymes. We have isocitrate dehydrogenase, step three, and, uh, and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Now, in the case of inhibiting enzyme four of step four, we essentially increase the buildup of the alpha-ketoglutarate. And when we increase the concentration of alpha-ketoglutarate, we can actually use the excess alpha-ketoglutarate to produce specific types of amino acids, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. In fact, we can also produce specific types of purine nitrogenous bases. So we see that the citric acid cycle is in fact regulated very closely by our cells. So we have these three different places where we can regulate the citric acid cycle. We can regulate it right here, so pyruvate decarboxylation, or we can regulate it at step three or step four of the citric acid cycle. In either case, we decrease the rate at which the citric acid cycle takes place because we don't want to produce any more ATP molecules.